Uh, our speaker this morning is Michael Thurman. Now, <clears throat> it says in his bio that he is a native of rural Clark County. That just shows how old he is because there's no rural Clark County anymore. <laughs> I promise not to tell any real stories about Michael. I may break it, but I, I'm holding to the promise because he's got a big stick. <laughs> but uh, Michael went to Payne College, University of South Carolina Law School, and, uh, and escaped Harvard. And, and you can talk to him for, for an hour, and you'll never hear him say anything in Harvardese. And it's an amazing ability to escape that place without sounding kooky. <laughs> but Michael's done a great job. He's an old friend. He, uh, he served in the House in 1986 for three terms. Uh, he, he has done a tremendous job for the state of Georgia over the years. In 1994, uh, he was appointed the, the director of the Division of Family and Children's Services. And that whole operation has just gone like this. The, he sponsored, pioneered, set up the, the Work First incentive. And, and that means that instead of people worrying about being on welfare and looking for their check, they have to look for a job first. And this is not, this, I mean, Michael had been doing things uh, uh, over the years. He set up a, a program in Athens to help small business people understand how to get through making a loan at a bank. And that sounds like a simple thing to do, but it's very difficult if you're not familiar with what goes on with it, and, and if you don't have your corporate lawyer to go with you when you go in there to do it. And he's done a, he's done a tremendous job for helping people in a lot of places. He, uh, the no, new welfare system is, is working and, and working well in Georgia because of Michael's efforts. He, uh, there's 25,000 families that have moved from welfare to employment while he's been there in the last three years, and that saved all of us about $80 million in taxes. So he, Michael's leaving DFACS. Uh, this may be his last official function as the director of DFACS, so we'll introduce him as the, uh, as the new head of the Carl Vinson Institute, <laughs> and he can make a speech from that angle if he would like. Michael. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Rogers, for, the wrong, for uh, the wrong introduction, for the right introduction, for a good introduction. Uh, Rogers and I go back a ways. We worked together on a few projects in my life. I've been through many manifestations in politics. Uh, one as a political consultant slash, I don't use the dirty word, lobbyist. <laughs> but uh, we worked together and uh, delighted and was thrilled to know that uh, he's assumed a position here with the uh, Public Policy Foundation. I want to thank each and every one of you for all that you are doing and have been doing uh, on behalf of the people of our great state. Uh, Kelly and I and Griff Doyle, and a few months ago, we went on the Georgia tour uh, as we went about the state uh, gathering input and information on Georgia's welfare reform plan. And I'm happy to report that uh, welfare reform in Georgia is moving in the right direction and we are continuing to do the right things for people throughout this state. I would like to say, and I read some of those articles last week too, as a matter of fact, about the empowerment zone, and uh, I was hoping, and I'm happy now, that you all won't have the opportunity to do a report on Georgia's welfare reform system before I leave. And, uh, and then I see Tripp Martin, and, who's been a longtime friend, and Skin Edge, we served together, and uh, Boyd Pettit, and so many other people around here. And you know, I, I got concerned, really. Read articles, then I see people I know, Kelly, Bob Irwin. I didn't know that so many of my friends were right wing extremists. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, Clint, it's good to be here to talk about welfare reform, and this is my last official public speech on the behalf or as the director of DFACS. And in the words of the Grateful Dead, it's been a long, strange trip and uh, that I've enjoyed tremendously. And because we are now, I think, doing a much better job as a state in, in trying to 
provide hope and opportunity for those who are poor and unemployed and impoverished in this state. I'm happy to report, and I didn't give Rogers an updated version of my resume, is that right now in the state of Georgia, in 1994, we started out with 116,000 families. Matter of fact, I got a chart. I want y'all to look at this chart. See, Mr. Milner, you're running for governor. You got to have a chart. <laughs> yeah. This is Ross Perot's great contribution to American politics. You got to have a chart. You don't get out on the stump without this. And you can see we started out, and these are adults on welfare in Georgia. Back in 94, we had about 116, 117,000 adults on welfare in Georgia. Well, as you can see, as of July 97, we have now 61,000 adults left on welfare in this state. That is a 47, almost 48 percent decline in the number of people who are receiving cash assistance adults in the state of Georgia. And that's important because as I've traveled the state, somehow, even though we've enjoyed some success, and by the way, let me say this, the success would not have been possible without a lot of people sitting in this room, the people who serve in the House and the Senate, and they are many. Uh, the minority leader, Senator Tysing, Judy Manning, we could not have done it. The success that Georgia had is a result of a bipartisan, biracial, cross-class coalition that came together, that went beyond the barriers and the boundaries of race and class, and partisanship, to be quite honest with you, to develop a plan and an initiative that administered to the needs not only of the recipients, but also of the taxpayers. And I think that speaks volumes. A reporter asked me just yesterday, so what's the most important thing that you can point to about welfare reform in Georgia? And oh, and I could have talked about the declining caseload. I could have talked about the hundred, really $23 million that we've saved, or the new rules, or the new laws. But the thing, as I think about it personally, that most important to me is that we were able to take what was projected to be probably one of the most divisive of all issues on the political spectrum. And within the confines and the context of that issue, we were able to lower the barriers of class and race and partisanship in this state. As I traveled around the state, I was always impressed by no matter where I went, north, south, east, and west, the audiences I talked to were integrated audiences, the business people were there, the recipients were there, the providers were there. We had people sitting who had never really talked before, sitting in the same rooms, at the same tables, discussing how we can develop common solutions to common problems. That was not what anyone really expected with welfare reform in this state. And of all the legacies, if I leave one, that is the one I'm most proud of. Because, you know, I've come to understand something about Georgia being the great state that it is. That if we are to truly continue to be the progressive state that we have the opportunity to be, we cannot afford to have a Georgia separated by geography, not a South Georgia or a North Georgia. We cannot afford to be separated by race and class, not a black or a white Georgia. And although I'm surrounded by many of my Republican friends, I'm not really interested in a Democratic or Republican Georgia. My vision for Georgia is to build one great Georgia for one great people. When we understand that truly no man or woman is an island alone unto themselves, when we understand that we are all created by a common creator, that the problems of the inner city, if soon, if not sooner, often becomes the problems of the suburbs. Then we can come together and address the issues in a professional and efficient and effective way. The first article, I want, this next article, I want you to look at it. This is important for business people. Because you know the missing link in welfare reform is we have had to get the business people to the table. When those 40 plus thousand adults left welfare and went to work, they left not because I bought a whip, not because I owned a pistol. They left really because we offered them better opportunities than what they had. 
And let me tell you, they would not have left welfare unless there was a business owner or a plant manager or a corporate executive who made a very profound and important decision. He or she decided to provide an opportunity to a person who was receiving public assistance to work in the public or private sector. The ultimate test of welfare reform is to find a good job that will pay an honest day's wage for an honest day's work. This article puts it in great context, and I think it's very important, Tripp. We talk now a lot about, well, uh, you know, how much does the good economy, how much can we really credit the good economy for, for, for the result of the reduction in the welfare rolls across this country, not just in Georgia? But two very intelligent men, one Doug Bactea and the other one Jeffrey Humphreys in this article points out that one of the reasons Georgia is in now is six year of economic expansion, unprecedented expansion, is because of the large number of people who are leaving welfare going to work. People who were receiving, by the way, the average welfare check in Georgia today is $235 a month. That's the cash assistance grant. That's the average check. Over in Alabama and Mississippi, it's less than $200 a month. I've been to chamber groups, and when I was really feeling pretty good, I, rather than answer the question, I would ask the question. Wayne Drummond, I said, well, how much do you think the average grant is? And I get different projections, 1,000, 800, 750. It's 235 a month. I hasten to add, my friend. I really don't know of anyone who could get rich or buy a new Cadillac of $235 a month. As a matter of fact, when I travel around Georgia, when I stop at my defects offices, I always, before I go in the building, I always stop and I'll scan the parking lot. I'm looking for this woman, this welfare recipient who is buying a new Cadillac every year, all $235. You know this woman. Representative Manning said, you know her, she rides up 75 with food stamp blowing out the window, right? <laughs> you hear all about it. This woman has caused me more problems than just about anybody else in the state of Georgia. <laughs> she really has. And if you see her, you call me. No matter where I am, I am going to track her down and put her in jail. Because this is the lady. We spend a whole lot of time in public sector and politics trying to create programs to combat this woman. She really has. The key to work first is we recognize something that I'll admit to. 10, 15 percent of the people on welfare, there's not a job that Microsoft could offer or that I could give that they would accept. They just don't want to work and they're not going to work. Senator Day, you know, I practiced law 15 years before I came to DFACS. You know what? 15% of the lawyers I've met in this world don't want to work and lazy. <laughs> 15% of the teachers, 15% of the doctors. I served in the House of Representatives. The percentage is a little bit higher there. Just don't, <laughs> just don't want to work. So what we really decided to do was rather than concentrate and waste all our energy on dealing with the 15%, we said, hey, let's look at the 85% who with some child care, with some training, with some job readiness skills, would leave welfare on their own and move into the workforce. And it's working. And it will continue to work. The other thing we decided to do was that we're not going to point fingers. You know, I've been on both sides of this table now. You know, I started studying welfare a long time ago. And my study actually began not at Harvard or Carolina or Payne, not in the General Assembly, not even at, in college. I began studying welfare as I sat at my mother's knee in a welfare office in Clark County, Georgia. Now, we were hardworking people. We raised cotton. We sharecropped it, really. But you know, you can't raise a lot of cotton in the wintertime because it does not grow. And so we would go into the defects offices in the wintertime to get food commodities. And you know, I tell my workers every day, I've told them this for three years, 
always be careful how you treat the little children who sit in your waiting room. Because one day, they might grow up to be the boss. <laughs> and I knew something else, that my mother, and work first is about not what, what policy makers have taught me, it's what my parents taught me. One, that there is dignity in work. Why do I emphasize work? Let's go back to the 235. If we are interested in getting people out of poverty, you will never get out of poverty receiving $235 a month from the state. See, my mission was not so much to take a welfare check from a teenage mother in Capital City home. And even if I do, what will I have accomplished? My mission is I understand that you can't raise two children off $235 a month. I've heard well-meaning people talk about the trillions of dollars we spend in the old welfare system trying to combat poverty. Well, folks, it was not an anti-poverty program to begin with. The old welfare system was an income maintenance system. It was not designed to reduce poverty. It was designed to provide a small amount of income for an unlimited period of time. The old system was not broke. The old system did exactly what the people in Washington intended it to do. And they intended it to do that because that was the cheapest way to provide assistance to people who were poor. If you want to run a cheap system, we just abolished it. It caused money to buy childcare and training and transportation in the short run. But in the long run, you do much better. The old system was not a jobs program. I was totally distressed when I came to DFACS and realized that 95% of my budget was being spent on maintaining people in a constant state of poverty and 5% was being provided to help people go to work. I was disgusted and we changed it. I don't call it compassion. My friends on the left and the right, there are some who consider the old system was a more compassionate system. But there's nothing compassionate about sending $230 a month to generation after generation of people who will live forever in a constant state of poverty and deprivation. There is no compassion in that strategy. We're moving up and we're moving on. But you know, we need you. We need the Public Policy Foundation at the table. We need administrators, as the, my replacement will be selected, who will be able to go not only to talk to the Democratic leadership, but who has the understanding, the knowledge, and the common sense to go to the Republican uh, caucus meetings as well. We need somebody who can talk to the Black caucus and the Women's caucus to understand that together we can develop a better solution to all of our problems. This has been great. My life has been changed in a way that I could never really quantify. I began now to understand what public service is really about. It's not about polls. It's not about election outcomes. It's not about winning or losing. Public service is truly about what it was originally intended to be, to try to do good for those who are somehow less fortunate than yourself. I encourage you to stay on this battlefield, to continue to give all that you can for our great state. And truly, we have a great state. And I'll leave you with this. As I have gone around Georgia, boy, it's been something. I've sat in cotton fields and talked to farmers about hiring people to pick cotton or pick tomatoes. I've gone to plant managers in middle Georgia. And one day, I was there in Bacon County, Georgia, where the real vision for Work First really came from. And I had two plant managers who had about 200 jobs available. I had a DFAX director who had about 250 people on welfare in the same county. Vacant jobs, people on welfare, same county. Plant managers crying about the fact they couldn't find anybody to hire. Anybody from South Georgia? See, you learn something out on the stump. If you ask people from South Georgia a question, they'll give you an answer. It may not be the answer you want, but they'll give you an answer. So I said, well, sir, what, what can we do at DFACS to develop some workers for you so you can, we can fill those jobs and we can get these folk off welfare and let them be tax producers as opposed to tax consumers? 
And he looked at me and said, well, son, I tell you. I said, son, what you looking for? He said, son, I tell you what I'm looking for. I'm looking for him on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. <laughs> what they're looking for is work ethic. He said, if you show, get me somebody who will show up on five days in a row at the right time with the right attitude, I'll teach them how to do this job. So we began to focus not on training, but on readiness, on getting the right attitude, and understanding that there's dignity in work, understanding that it's not just what you earn, but it's also what you learn that's important in the workplace. And we are making a difference, but this is it, and I'll try to answer some questions. This is what I've told my workers, I've told business people, politicians, this is what I keep telling myself about why this job is important, about why you're important, why you all invited me. You know, this is special for you all to have invited me here today. It really is, and I take it as a great honor. Because, you know, there are those on the outside who don't believe that, you know, I guess there's some folk in Atlanta who just don't believe, right, that you all really want to hear anything a black man got to say. You know that, don't you? White ring extremist is a cold word for what? <laughs> Racist. Just like welfare in some people's minds and on some people's lips is a cold word for who? Black folk. It's a mean, cruel, godless game when we play those word games out there. And see, I don't, I don't accept it at any level from anybody. I hope you watched George Wallace, the docudrama that was on TNT. It was a great docudrama. I loved it. I've watched it twice now. When he said that, yeah, said, I don't use race anymore, but they know what I'm talking about. That's what we have to protect against. But it's from Matthew, 25th chapter. And we all want to know what you have to do. I always ask the question, well, what do I have to do to be a good person? To, to one day uh, have some eternal salvation. What do I have to do? Do I have to sing in the choir? Do I have to be, make big contributions to my church? Do I have to serve on the deacon board? And basically one day the 12 disciples were having a general conversation. And their leader heard them talking. And he walked over to them and he says, fellas, remember I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And the disciples said, but wait, Lord, now I don't ever, ever remember you being hungry. And I don't ever remember feeding you. I don't ever remember you being thirsty. And when did I give you drink? I don't ever remember you being a stranger. And when did I welcome you? Or naked and clothed you? When were you sick? And when did I come to visit you? And the king answered and says, Truly I say to you that as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. So what I leave you with, my friends, as I end my last speech in this job, that as you do to the least of Georgia's citizens, the poorest, most uneducated, unskilled teenage mother in this state, as you do it to them, you do it to him. And that is ultimately what and how we will all be judged. Thank you so much for your leadership and your friendship. Kelly got, you know Kelly got a question. Come on, Kelly. Kelly got a question. Michael, we had the great success. We passed these laws. What's the next step? Is there some things the Georgia General Assembly still needs to do, or do we just need to let the current plan work up? What's the next step? Uh, 
First, I think our elected leaders should continue to be vigilant. Uh, there's an issue, uh, and Mr. Milne and I have talked about this, uh, this whole issue with 60,000, these last 60,000 recipients will be much more difficult to place than the first 40 or 50,000. These last 60,000 people are people, Superintendent Cherenko, who have very little public edu uh, uh, formal education. Many of them have multiple barriers, i.e. alcohol, drug addiction. About 20% of them suffer from physical and mental disabilities. The disabled poor continues to be the most underserved population. So we are going to have to do, come together in what I call holistic welfare reform efforts and to create innovative ways. The next big issue, I think, for the General Assembly, too, will be to look at this whole issue of child welfare. Because quite frankly, folks, there will be some people who will not make it under the system that we've created. We have to understand and accept this. There are some people who will run into this four-year, 48-month wall in just over two to three years. And so we need to begin to think about, Senator, how we're going to address the issues of those children who then will be without support from the state because their parents did not or could not uh, uh, succeed in our more work-focused environment. And the research on the long range is what you do with Amy. Where's Amy? I mean, Amy's a great researcher. Amy, Amy did a great job developing the reports, and she wasn't overly critical of us, so y'all give Amy a hand. I like that. She, <laughs> she, she, did, she did a great job. And speaking of researchers, I got three people I really have to, this is last chance. Sharon Bivens, who really, some folks said was the brain behind Mike Thurman. This is the person who developed the plans and wrote the plan. Pat Smith, who's my administrative assistant. Pat, stand up. She's also on the school board in the Marietta City School System. She's my secretary administrative assistant. Where's Roger? Stand up. Roger writes my speeches that I rarely read, but Roger's the man. <laughs> Y'all get him a hand. Eh? Jake. Well, obviously, we, well, not obviously, but we cannot serve illegal immigrants, not knowingly anyway. There's really no option there for us. Uh, for the legal immigrants, uh, Congress went back with the president, and the uh, Congress went back and kind of reshaped the budget in terms of providing some services for legal immigrants. But the immigrant population, and, you know, and I've said this many, many times before, we have much less problems helping legal immigrants off the system than we do American citizens. The people who come to this country don't come to sightsee. They come looking for work. And consequently, but the big issue is the whole issue of language and helping them to become proficient and efficient in the English language, which I said pretend things for the public education system, Superintendent. Mr. Milne. Michael, we've got people here, John White, for example, Coca-Cola Company. What could the company's representatives here, if they want to reach out and, and, and help a dozen They can do what you did many, many times. Just come on down to the welfare office and say, I want to see Mike Thurman. Get him out here, which is what you did. Uh, but really, to contact your local office, Wayne Drummond is here. He's a DeKalb County DFAC director. And part of what I'll be doing, I, I'm consulting not just with governments, but also with businesses. We have a team of people down at the state office who deal directly with the corporate sector. And we have now about 30 major corporations uh, in the metro area that we are working with out here in Cobb uh, uh, at the Georgian Club. We, right here, right, Jude? Yeah, yeah. At Futron. We set up individualized training programs with different corporations. They've trained nine people now who are training to become chefs. Am I right? 
And uh, Jerry Hughes, a good friend of mine who's been to Washington to talk about welfare reform, we've been on TV programs together, is the person who came up with that. We need innovation and creativity, I think. That's the most important thing. The big issue, too, education. There's two ways. Getting people off welfare is one thing. Preventing the need for welfare is even more important. The, the, the preventing the need for welfare. And the superintendent is here, and the best way to prevent the need for welfare is to help young people finish school and get a quality education. That is the best way to do it. And we have to support the public education system. We really, whether we got kids in it or not, we need to support public school. We really do. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. And the new law, by the way, Reverend, you're exactly right. The new law encourages states to work with faith-based organizations. It is in the statute. And there are some uh, uh, protections so that we don't breach the, 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 the uh, separation between church and state. Because government cannot do it alone. Government cannot get this job done. You've got to have the community and the churches and the business. Yes, sir. Actually not, because where will have the greatest impact with those states who are going to rely a whole lot on community service? And what the law said was that if you place people in community service, you have to pay them minimum wage and also have to observe other labor uh, uh, restrictions. That would have been a budget buster if we had had to pay everybody in community service. And what we are doing, we are focusing on work in the private sector. The thing with community service is that you're still getting cash, you're still getting food stamps, you're still getting, I mean, it's very expensive, and the person still doesn't have a job. The other thing about the new Reconciliation Act that I think pretends for the future that we all should be pay close attention to is that Congress and the President placed a $3 billion welfare to work program in the budget but they put it in the Labor Department. The group that will deal most directly with the hard to serve population, the agency that will do it, not DFACS, but the Department of Labor. That's where the focus and the battle is shifting to in dealing with the most difficult to place people. Yes. You know, I, I didn't realize this until too late in my administration that the Labor Department can, you can get a bond. Anybody here from the Labor Department that would know anything about this? People with criminal records can be bonded as a pro. Is that right, Roy? Yes,
And the question goes to another group, back to Kelly, this is good, I'm back to your, your question because now I'm thinking through it. The non-custodial, the men, will have to be a focus of welfare reform in the future. Another reform bill that went through the legislature that received very low media attention was the re-reform the child support enforcement system. And now the state has a much broader range of uh, powers to collect child support from non-custodial for others. What I find is that welfare reform is much too feminine in its image and its depiction. Me women are on welfare not just because they don't have a job, but primarily because the fathers of their children refuse to support those children. And so if we're going to solve it, we have to go to the source of the problem and address the issue of, number one, fathers who can but won't, and those who want to but don't quite have the opportunity economically to do so. Representative Bradford. Yes. 97% of the non-custodials are men, which is why I use it, 3% women. But unfortunately, the percentage of women who are non-custodials is growing. Uh, one more question, and then we'll have to go. Neil? You made policy changes around Georgia. What has to happen at the local level and the community level? Do you think that the community should be the local devolution. Which really, if you think about it, kind of began with Reagan more than 15 years ago with the new federalism. This welfare bill is a result of that process that began over 15 years ago when he began to talk about the new federalism. And decentralization or devolution of federal government, the ultimate resting place is not at the state capitol on Marietta Street. It's in local communities. If you follow the concept to its logical conclusion, is that in the future, local governments communities will have a lot more say-so over how they impact and deal with issues of poverty and unemployment. You will see in the future that Wayne Drummond in DeKalb County will be able to shape his own budget, not a budget dictated by the state to address the issues of DeKalb or Cobb. And so ultimately communities, which is one of my missions, to go out and empower communities to get the key players in the same room, under the same roof, sitting at the same table, beginning to address common issues with common solutions. That is the ultimate vision and goal I have for not just welfare reform, but I think dealing with education, economic development, all the other issues that address this great state. Thank you.